BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. How's everybody doing? I hope everyone had a good weekend. Just a couple of quick announcements and reminders before we truly begin. The first is that I've been doing this show for about six years now, and mostly focusing on true crime cases. And over the last six years, I have noticed a lot of different aspects within the world of human behavior. And right now, I'm just noting them down and organizing them, and I'm going to be incorporating them into a new writing project in the future. I'm not exactly sure exactly what that will look like, but please be on the lookout for some new things associated with Black Box Online Radio, and to something a little bit more immediate. As previously stated last week, there are a new set of, there is a new set of short episodes that are available here on BBOR on the YouTube Shorts page. I've been doing some one-minute true crime book reviews, and for the last week, I did them on Zodiac Killer Solved, How to Find Zodiac by Jared Kobach, and the Zodiac Killer Cover-Up by Lyndon Lafferty. Zodiac Killer Solved is, of course, the book by Ray Grant. As far as the book How to Find Zodiac by Jared Kobach, I've talked about that one on a previous Zodiac Killer news report. However, I said some very praiseworthy things about it in the in the YouTube short episode. Again, it's a one-minute true crime book review. I didn't want to be purely nasty. But when it comes to Jared Kobach and his Zodiac suspect, Paul Doer, I found that there is a very big divide. And I was reading this conversation on the Zodiac Killer Discord, and two people were just sharing exactly what I thought about the book, the two responses. The first is that Jared Kobach wrote two books on the Zodiac Killer mystery, Motor Spirit and How to Find Zodiac, and it's like a creative retelling of a story that we've all heard countless times. But, and this is a very important but, it is filled with factual errors and only demonstrates a minimal understanding of not only the Zodiac Killer case, but also other true crime cases when he talks about Charles Manson as well as the Slender Man attempted murder. I even found some notes on that one. When you go back and listen to the Zodiac Killer news reports talking about Jared Kobach. So it definitely is not at the level of an expert who is publishing multiple Zodiac Killer books. But the parts about it that he did get right are at the very least um, done in a rather engaging way. So perhaps it's not the worst set of books in the world, but it's definitely not the best. And perhaps it hasn't hurt the mystery too much, but it also hasn't really helped. And I don't know if you're going to really learn a lot from reading Jared Kobeck's material, but if anyone would like to dispute that with me in the comment section, feel free to put your ideas down below. And you can also hit the like button and subscribe. Those are some of the best ways to help out the channel. Definitely hit the subscribe button because a lot of people who listen to this show, who tune into Zodiac Monday, are not subscribed to Black Box Online Radio. I cannot invite you enough. Hit that subscribe button and uh, you can follow along with all of the true crime discussions. Wednesday, talking about Jack the Ripper. On the weekends, I've been doing a regular segment about Jean Benet Ramsey. And of course, there's the Anything Goes Friday segment 
talking mostly about true crime and serial killers, but any subject is fair game. And if you would like to support any of these efforts, you can go over to buymeacoffee.com, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnet88. That website allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show, and anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. Now, there is a Zodiac suspect whom I have discussed in one of these news reports oh, recently. I did one episode where I was talking about John Parr Cox, and this is um, the work of somebody named Adam. He's running a YouTube channel called uh, Zodiac Killer Revealed 2023, and I've had the opportunity to correspond with Adam as he is going through his research and looking into his suspect, John Parr Cox, he becomes a Zodiac suspect because he lived in the vicinity of the Zodiac Killer's final crime, the murder of Paul Stein on October 11th of 1969. And I don't want to share everything that Adam has even shared with me, because this is all unpublished research, and he is still assembling it in a particular order, and I can accept that. But there will be some more discussions on John Parr Cox in the future. I'm tempted to call him a railroad tycoon, but I don't know if that's the most appropriate way to categorize him. He worked for the Santa Fe Railroad, and in the previous episode, I said that something that Adam had stated on his YouTube channel, that the Zodiac Killer's symbols, the symbols that were used in the Zodiac ciphers, could have come from a railroad poster that was used by the railroad line that John Park Cox worked for. But the big piece of news that I want to share with you is that these are some samples of his handwriting. And I'm going to go out on a limb, and I might regret saying this, but I think that this is one of the closest matches to the Zodiac Killer's handwriting, if not the closest. And if you're looking at this on the screen, you might notice that some of them are in blue and some are in black. The ones that have been underlined belonged to John Parr Cox, and the ones without the underline belong to the Zodiac. I mean, definitely that letter W. You also notice that there's a particular gap in the letter R. I mean, this might really be one of the closest matches to the Zodiac Killer's handwriting that I have ever seen. So uh, please tune in to this channel to hear more about John Park Cox in the future. You can also go to, as I said, Zodiac Killer Revealed 2023. And even more importantly than that, just be on the lookout for more discussions about John Park Cox in the near future. I think he's going to be discussed in a lot of Zodiac Killer conversations. In addition to that, to share some other news, Drew Beeson released a new episode of the Zodcast. He does that on his channel called Drew Beeson. He's the author of Sighting In on the Zodiac Killer and talks a lot about Donald D. Cheney as a Zodiac Killer suspect. Don Cheney is Drew's suspect. And he was discussing some of the observations that were made by Stefan Nyberg, who wrote an essay concerning the Zodiac Killer's exorcist letter, which I talked about last week. And overall, the... um. There's an extremely convincing case that has been made that the Zodiac Killer's mistakes, his spelling errors, were completely intentional. The Zodiac Killer would not only commit murders, but also write in the cryptograms, as well as in just writing in letters, and they are filled with misspellings. Why would somebody do that? I think this really goes to Stefan's credit. It's by almost demonstrating that the Zodiac is intentionally misspelling words and letters for comedic effect, or making a mockery of things. And a clear example of this is the exorcist letter that Stefan was discussing in his essay by pointing out that the Zodiac has the words satirical and comedy misspelled. And what he did was he took the vowels from the fourth letter in each of these words, satirical and comedy, and switched to them and Again, it's trying to do something, maybe even satirical or comedic, to him. I mean, it's not really super funny to us. However, it seems like it's very, very deliberate. And, uh, if you would like to hear a larger discussion on this, once again, you can go over to Drew Beeson's channel and find his latest episode of the Zodcast. And you can also read um, Stefan Nyberg's essay on the Exorcist letter. But there is a counter-argument that was shared by somebody named Soren Korsgaard in his book, America's Jack the Ripper, and he proposed that it was possible that the Zodiac Killer was dyslexic, and that was a reason for the misspellings. And the reason I'm bringing that up with you is, when I was corresponding with Adam about his Zodiac suspect, John Parr Cox, he also shared with me that John Parr Cox was dyslexic. 
And some of you guys in the comments section asked this. Even Barry Lauber, who introduced me to Adam's channel about John Parcox, asked me this. How do we really know that he is um, verifying everything? I mean, we have to accept that all of his research is accurate and all of these statements are accurate. So I just decided to ask Adam, what is your source for all of this information? Like, how are you getting these samples of his handwriting and learning these details about John Parcox? And his response was that he obtained them by doing research at the library for the University of California at Berkeley and going through the records. So I'm just curious to see what Adam is going to keep finding, and I'm going to accept um, his claims until... Um, I mean, I'm going to accept his claims for the time being. I definitely don't want to just simply doubt someone because you have no reason to trust them. I don't think that that would be a very effective one. We would be doubting everybody and just be saying that, no, no, they're not credible, so I'm not going to pay attention to them. But I would like to move on to the next subject, and that is firstly giving a shout out to Professor Japanese 007, a longtime follower of Black Box Online Radio, who made a comment about two possible Zodiac Killer crimes, and the murders of uh, Richard Redditch, as well as the murder of Brian V. McDonald. And Brian McDonald is someone whom I've discussed very briefly on this channel, but I've never actually mentioned him by name, and he was the victim from the Park Police Station explosion. And could this have been a crime that is connected to the Zodiac Killer? Some people think that the Zodiac Killer simply committed a series of shootings and one stabbing in 1968 and 69, and then everything else is all just made up, or it's not Zodiac-related, and the Zodiac's writing in all these letters and cards and ciphers, trying to make himself look like the most um, crazy criminal in the world, the craziest criminal in the world, rather, but it's all just um, a smoke screen, it's all just a distraction from the actual truth that the Zodiac only murdered five people. But other people think that the Zodiac Killer was actually a very prolific serial killer who committed an enormous amount of crimes using an enormous amount of methods. And to help us out, I would like to go over to a, an article that was published on ZodiacCiphers.com run by Richard Rennell, and it's called The Park Police Station Blast. On April 20th of 1970, the Zodiac Killer made reference to the murder of San Francisco police officer Brian McDonald, who was 44 years old at the time. On February 16th of 1970, Brian McDonald suffered devastating and sadly fatal injuries two months earlier when a bomb packed with fence staples exploded on an outside ledge of Park Police Station in the Upper Haight neighborhood. He wrote, he meaning the Zodiac, I hope you do not think that was I, who, I was the one who wiped out that blue beanie with a bomb at the cop station while simultaneously giving us a diagram of a bomb to be placed just 274 feet from another cop station, that of Ingleside. This sense of irony didn't seem lost on the Zodiac Killer. What the Zodiac Killer knew of Brian McDonnell, other than what he read in the intervening two months, is unknown, but in the remainder of his short message he stated, But there is more glory in killing a cop than killing a Sid because a cop can shoot back. And yes, it's almost certainly talking about a kid, but it is spelled C-I-D. This is another Zodiac Killer um, misspelling. Was this just an offhand comment, or was this statement relevant to the history of Sergeant Brian McDonald? And I don't know about you guys, but when I first read this years ago, this thing about, I hope you don't think that was I thought I was the one who wiped out that blue meanie with a bomb at the cop station, but there is more glory in killing a cop than a kid because a cop can shoot back. I believe the full context is it wouldn't do to move in on someone else's territory, but there is more glory in killing a cop than a kid because a cop can shoot back. I just thought that that made absolutely no sense at all, and that this is just some type of deranged, almost nonsensical rambling. That was my initial response years ago to reading it just now, I can perhaps comprehend it a little bit more, saying, and the Zodiac is saying that he did not detonate the bomb, but he did plan on going after police officers in the future, or that he was planning to detonate a bomb that was going to kill kids. Now, the Zodiac very, very famously targeted school children, and he also said that he was going to detonate a bus bomb, but as far as this one here, 
I mean, what do you side with? Is the Zodiac Killer being clear and cogent and coherent, or is the Zodiac Killer just some type of nonsensical madman? And I wanted to ask this particular challenge question because somebody wrote a comment over the weekend that more or less said, the Zodiac Killer was crazy. There's no motive for crazy. And this is a very, very important thing to examine because could these statements just be absolute nonsense? And, I mean, I always go back to Inspector Mark Rowley, who was involved with the Madeleine McCann case, who stated that it is inappropriate to try and examine the thinking of a madman or the thinking of the killer or the criminal or the perpetrator because they may not be functioning the way that you are. You might be a sane person, and they might be an insane person. So to try and unravel the thinking of a madman is impractical. But I would like to go back to the article from ZodiacCiphers.com. The Desert Sun newspaper, February 17, 1970, read, Haight-Ashbury Police Station, rocked by bomb, six officers injured in blasts showering Big U staples. A powerful bomb packed with U-shaped staples rocked a Haight-Ashbury District Police Station Monday night, injuring six policemen. One of them was the new police chief, A. Nelder, and he said that a fused explosive was placed on the rear window sill of the sergeant's office at Park Station in Golden Gate Park. The thunderous blast, which jarred residents for blocks around, sprayed staples through the office like a miniature machine gun set of bullets. Sergeant Brian V. McDonald fell gravely wounded with multiple head injuries. Patrolman Robert Fogarty, age 43, and Frank Rath, age 27, were hospitalized with multiple puncture wounds. Officers Alfred Arno, age 24, Robert O'Sullivan, age 26, and Ronald Martin, 28, were treated for lesser injuries. All I remember was a bomb exploded, said one shaken officer, who survived with only scratches. I saw Sergeant McDonald lying in the rubble, bleeding from an artery wound in his neck. Police immediately sealed off the area and rerouted traffic. First reports indicated the building had been demolished. The blast did knock out all of the power in the station and shattered every window. It also demolished the sergeant's police station wagon, which was parked behind the station near Kazar Stadium, where the San Francisco 49ers play opponents. There were reports that a man was seen running from the station, and police later said a white and pink van was sighted leaving the area. However, there were no immediate suspects. Well, a white and pink fan, I certainly don't think that is something that is similar to the vehicles described by the Zodiac Killer, particularly, particularly the, um, after the Blue Rock Springs shooting, where, um, Mike Michaud and Darlene Farron were shot, because Mike Michaud went on to s survive the shooting, and he stated that it could have been a Corvair, or someone not even shared this in the comment section once, confirming that Mike Michaud stated that it might have been a Ford Falcon, that he said that in an interview, but those are either sedans or possibly um, coupes, and not a white and pink van, not a very um, inconspicuous car, or vehicle rather, to use when you're trying to detonate a bomb like this, but it should also be noted that it is not 100% certain that the Zodiac, um, or that the perpetrator was driving the white and pink van. So, I want to ask you guys another challenge question. Do you believe the Zodiac Killer was actually following through with any of his threats involving a bomb, and he wanted to detonate a bomb? And some people think that the entire Z-32 cipher is all about detonating a bomb. And let's look at the evidence for this. The Zodiac is openly saying that he is going to use a bomb to kill people. The Zodiac is openly drawing out diagrams for making bombs. Therefore, he is showing that he has either some intent to use them, or he has some type of knowledge of how the creation of a bomb would work. And is there any chance that the Zodiac Killer planted this bomb at the police station, detonated it, and then only loosely took credit for it by saying that he wanted to... Um, he, he wouldn't move in on someone else's territory, but there's more glory in, a in killing a cop than killing a kid. I would like to get back to the article because we will see that there is a very clear additional possibility of a Zodiac Killer tie-in. The uncle of Brian McDonald was Sergeant Joseph Lacey, murdered on December 30th of 1956 while socializing with a friend in a tavern. The two were enjoying a drink when two armed men burst into the establishment with the intention of robbing it. Sergeant Lacey, dis despite being off-duty, drew his gun and attempted to stop the robbery, but was beaten to the draw sadly. 
when was killed. One of the robbers was apprehended shortly after the crime and pled guilty to first-degree murder. The actual shooter of Sergeant Lacey remained a free man for nearly three years before being captured and found guilty of second-degree murder. Fourteen years after the murder of Joseph Lacey, the end of watch would unfortunately befall a Upon his nephew Brian McDonnell and uh, the photos that you're actually looking at of Brian McDonnell are from two different times in his life there's a younger photo that I actually found on findagrave.com and then there's one of them that is closer to the age of his death near the end of his life one more time Brian V McDonnell passed away at the age of 44 and the V actually stood for Valentine that was his middle name but if there is a connection to the Zodiac Killer mystery, it goes beyond just there is more glory in killing a cop than killing a kid because a cop can shoot back. The Zodiac Killer also mailed something called the Dragon Card, one which I have not truly explored that much here on Black Box Online Radio. And that's mostly because I've been turning it over to Drew Beeson, again, host of the Zodcast, who has made a lot of observations about the Dragon Card. And on the front of the Dragon Card, I think that I mean, there's a very strong case that the two characters there are meant to represent uh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. And, of course, Drew's suspect is Donald Lee Cheney, and he talks about how Don Quixote, Don Cheney, and Sancho Panza it could also be referring to Sandy Panzarella. But I would like to look at something that could be connected to the death of Brian V. McDonnell, and... The card reads, I hope you enjoy yourselves when I have my blast. P.S. on back. And that was um, indicating that the the um, back of also contains a message. To put everything in full context, I would like to use the text that was shared by ZodiacKiller.com. And this was mailed on April 28th of 1970, postmark San Francisco, California, sent to San Francisco Chronicle. Sorry to hear your ass is a dragon. And of course, um, instead of riding on a donkey, then um, the donkey can also be referred to as an ass. Your ass is a dragon. Then it appears to be Don Quixote on a dragon. I hope you enjoy yourselves when I have my blast. P.S. on back. If you do not want to have this blast, you must do two things. Tell everyone about the bus bomb with all the details. I would like to see some nice Zodiac buttons wandering around town. Everyone else has these buttons like Black Power, Melvin Eats Blubber, etc., well, it would cheer me up considerably if I saw a lot of people wearing my button. Please, please, uh, no, please no nasty ones like Melvin's. Thank you. And there's a zodiac symbol as a cross circle sign off. Now you might be wondering, well, this is talking about the bus bomb, right? Not the police station bombing. But what some people think the zodiac killer was doing was using things as almost pre-Zodiac crimes, or he would be trying to test out his explosives. I mean, these are all just hypotheticals and possibilities. But let's just go beyond the murder of Brian McDonnell, and let's look at the Dragon Card as a standalone. And if you look at the handwriting on this, particularly the handwriting that's on the backside of the Dragon Card, it heavily resembles the Melvin Belli letter that was mailed in December of 1969, which contained a piece of Paul Stein's bloody shirt. However, once you look at the second half of the Dragon Card, the text on the back, that is, that also resembles some of the earlier Zodiac handwritings from the summer and early fall of 1969. So I think that that just goes to show once again that the same person wrote the early Zodiac communications and wrote the Melvin Belli letter and wrote the Dragon Card, and that with the Melvin Belli letter, either the Zodiac was on his best behavior or that was actually his natural writing style, and the earlier communications are sloppy. And for the longest time, I said, the Melvin Belli letter is not authentic. It's just a different person's handwriting. I don't care if it had a piece of Paul Stein's bloody shirt. It must have been an active participant who was working in alongside somebody else, working in conjunction with somebody else. No, it appears that this person was altering their handwriting style at some point throughout the Zodiac Killer mystery, but it does it does all seem consistent with one person's penmanship and handprinting, and I would, say, I would use the dragon card as evidence of that. But the dragon card is also being very, very clear that the Zodiac has plans to commit crimes with explosives. And, again, when I first read this stuff years ago, 
my immediate response to all of them was that the Zodiac is simply a liar. The Zodiac is just full of crap. I thought that anything the Zodiac did without demonstrating proof of was a lie, was a fiction, it was made up. This person is just trying to confuse people. I mean, I really thought that. I was like, there never was a bomb. There never was a plan to detonate a bus bomb. Or even if in some twisted way he was taking credit for the murder of Brian McDonald, that wasn't a real confession. Or saying that he's going to go after children. Or that he's going to eventually find more glory in killing a cop because a cop can shoot back. No. I was like, all of that stuff is fake. And the reasons why were that the Zodiac could so easily demonstrate that he was taking credit for the crimes, providing details that only he and the police knew, sending in the pieces of Paul Stein's bloody shirt, or even writing a message on the car door at Lake Berryessa after the stabbing of Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard. So, it just didn't sit well with me that we again have to just look at these very loose and vague statements and think that this person is telling the truth. Because one thing that is almost universally accepted by everyone is that the Zodiac Killer was not just a murderer, not just a serial killer, but the Zodiac was indeed a terrorist. And the letters are about creating the image of terror. And this person doesn't even have to commit the crimes anymore. People are already on the lookout for the Zodiac Killer. He's given himself this weird and perplexing name that perhaps he stole from the movie Charlie Chan at Treasure Island. And also, he is trying to certify the early crimes, but he doesn't need to do anything greater than that. He has a symbol. He has a name. He's already proven that he has committed murders. Therefore, the image of terror has gone nationwide all across the country. And somebody posted this in one of the recent Facebook groups. Or sorry, someone posted this recently in one of the Zodiac Killer Facebook groups to get the word order right, that some people were saying that we can't only look at Zodiac crimes in California, not only in Arizona. We also need to look at Zodiac crimes in New Mexico, without a whole lot of specifics. But that's just it. The Zodiac killer created this nationwide image of terror that is still being talked about to this day. So I don't necessarily think that the Zodiac would have had the strongest plans to actually detonate these explosives. But I could be completely wrong about that. I mean... It could have been that the Zodiac was actually committing the murder of Brian McDonald and then just uh, dodging the blame for that because he was um, just using that as a test run with one of his explosive devices and then had a larger plan to detonate the bus bomb. I mean, that could have been the case, or there could have been something that was just completely um, unrelated. And as... um. As far as I understand, though, there are alternative suspects in the murder of Brian McDonald, the um, Weather Underground, as well as the uh, Black uh, Liberation movements at the time, but the case still remains unsolved. And ultimately, um, a lot of these crimes do go, go unsolved. Very sadly, the perpetrators get away with it. But what do you think about the Zodiac's plans to uh, detonate a bomb? Do you think that um, they were real, or do you think they were fake? And I want to be very clear. I want to be very clear about something. It is entirely possible the Zodiac was honest about everything, that he has a bus bomb, it just it was a dud, and it got he got swamped out by the rain that they had a while back, as the Zodiac said, so the bus bomb didn't work and didn't function properly. Well, I mean... What do you think? Like, do you think the Zodiac's being truthful, or do you think that he's a total liar? I tend to lean more toward the liar aspect of it, but I absolutely cannot prove or, or certify that. Now, going on to the next segment here on Black Box Online Radio, firstly, I would like to give a shout-out to Chris Todd, who provided me with a copy of his book, Ron's Revenge, which was about the O.J. Simpson case and the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. Ron's revenge, meaning that Chris Todd may have uncovered some new discoveries in that one. And of course, the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman happened decades after the Zodiac crimes. But I'm giving a shout out again to Stefan Nyberg, who pointed out that there are a lot of similarities between the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson and the murder of Sherry Jo Bates in 1966. Sherry Jo Bates was murdered on October 30th of 1966 outside of the Riverside City College. And no, absolutely not, absolutely not suggesting they were killed by the same person, but looking at the similarities as to how the crimes were committed. As there could be certain revealing elements about the perpetrator's behavior, psychopathology, 
profiling, as well as just trying to get an understanding of how closely and how familiar were um, the women who were murdered by their killers and the killers themselves. So Sherry Jo Bates was stabbed multiple times. She was also slashed across the face and cut across the throat. And in some reports, it even states that she was almost beheaded with the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson in the early 90s, 1994. She was also stabbed and she was slashed and cut across the throat. And the, they also very frequently use that term, almost beheaded. And I'm going to be very blunt with you guys. I think that O.J. Simpson did it. I think that he was responsible. And I think that he committed those crimes and he was just found not guilty. Some people don't agree, but that's my take on the subject. But what does that show? Personal connection. Committing a crime by knife. A more intimate and familiar victim. Someone who has a long history with the victim and a long history of emotional issues. And was Sherry Jo Bates familiar with her attacker? Normally, I would say there's no evidence to support that. Oh, but there is evidence to support that. Because we have the Riverside Confession, which came a month after the murder of Sherry Jo Bates, in November of 1966, when not only does somebody take credit for the murder in writing, they also state that they knew who Sherry Jo Bates was, they killed her because... He wanted to make her pay for the brush offs that she had experienced that she had given him over the past years that he had experienced because of her, and that this person is showing very direct animosity toward women and only women, and that he's going to go after other women saying being beware I'm stalking your girls now and I think that this is just so different than the zodiac killer in every aspect of the crime, but there are a lot of people who disagree with me and believe that Sherry Jo Bates was actually the first victim of the zodiac killer, or perhaps one of many pre zodiac murders that went all the way back to nineteen sixty two so I mean, I can definitely comprehend how somebody is committing a crime by knife, they're trying to rig the system so um they had to have Sherry Joe Bates in some type of confrontation, pulling a distributor wire from or pulling the wire from her distributor so her car wouldn't start talking to her, getting her into some type of tough situation, cornering her in an alley, pulling out a knife and stabbing her. It could have been that it was a deranged individual that just wanted to have a conversation with her. It's like, no, you need to listen to me this one time. And then the situation heated up and boiled over. Or it could have been a direct and calculated murder plot. I'm really quite uncertain. But somebody once wrote into the channel saying that there was um, a similar story that happened in the Midwest several years after. I mean, like, a, a substantial amount of time later, and it didn't seem like the same killer, but there was this man who was just roaming around a college campus, trying to blend in with the students, as well as just the other people who worked on the campus, and become non-threatening, and he stabbed a woman, and he didn't know who she was, it's just he was an opportunistic predator. And these types of crimes do exist, and they exist without a an established relationship, or without the victim knowing the killer. But overall, I do tend to think that Sherry Jo Bates was um, familiar with her killer, or at the very least, the killer knew her. And the killer had some direct and intimate fascination with Sherry Jo Bates. Infatuation was the word that I was trying to think of. And it really is similar to the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson, where you might have somebody who was a very jealous, disgruntled, either ex-companion or someone who wanted to be her companion, and they went to confront her, and the situation got out of control. That person pulled a knife, which they may have carried regularly, and stabbed her to death. But what do you think about any of those observations? And um, please share your ideas in the comments section down below. I would love to read your messages. But here's another point. We have to be aware that in the true crime world, we cannot follow just like these guidelines and these psychological profiling statements that everyone has to accept. On the weekends, I was doing the segment about John Benet Ramsey, and I read off some points from the FBI profiler John Douglas, 
and he was talking about how when a victim is murdered by their family member, normally the body is placed in a peaceful way, whereas Jean Benet Ramsey's body was not. I mean, that's just an absolutely unnecessary statement. It's irrelevant to the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey because, in the overwhelming majority of theories that people have about her case, they're stating that it was staged, that it was made to look like somebody else did it. They were trying to make it look like a family member did it. They were trying to make it look like some type of outside intruder or botched kidnapper committed the crime. So, of course, the body wouldn't be placed in a peaceful way. And jean Benet Ramsey was found with duct tape over her mouth and her arms were tied and bound. And she was found in one of the rooms in the basement of her Boulder, Colorado home back in 1996. So that is, again, a very different statement. I mean, like, it's just not relevant. But in the um, most recent episode that I did on jean Benet Ramsey, which came out over the weekend, I also found just that some of the claims that they were making in the book The Other Side of Suffering were, again, not exactly relevant, talking about how an abductor who is abusing children would most likely abduct the victim, abuse them, and then return the victim to the family or to leave them in some type of secluded area, or just abandon them. Those, those those crimes definitely happen, but not all the time, and that shouldn't even be anybody's expectation, because I had just done the Anything Goes Friday segment about the serial killer Albert Fish, who abducted children and murdered them. And again, he was a serial killer, the Moon Maniac, the uh, Brooklyn Vampire, the Salvation Center. He has lots of nicknames. The Gray Man is another one. So this is also just something that you cannot put these these like factors into play and just think that they are set in stone, that these are the rules that a killer is going to follow, or that they're patterns and trends and behaviors that you have to find. And one example that I think just shatters everything in the rule book, everything in the profiling manual, everything in the textbooks on serial killers would be the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer committed some crimes by knife and some crimes by gun. The Zodiac Killer also used rope, and sometimes he did not. Sometimes he took trophies. Other times he did not. He took credit for his crimes in very bizarre ways, such as mailing in pieces of Paul Stein's bloody shirt, as I said. He wrote the message on Brian Hartnell's car door, but even more famously, he also made phone calls after the Blue Rock Spring shooting and after the Lake Berryessa stabbing, taking credit for the crimes. And the Zodiac is also someone who created these types of cryptograms and puzzles, and as of now, they have never truly shared the Zodiac Killer's identity, or even given us anything of value and substance. And I'm really quite curious what people will find about the Z13 and the Z32 ciphers. The Zodiac had four ciphers that have been authenticated, more or less. The Z408, the Z340 have been solved, the Z13 and the Z32 have not. But that just goes to show you that the Zodiac is just an absolutely inconsistent serial killer. And giving a shout-out to Jay in the comments section who talked about how when you, we look at the crimes and just... He's, he's talking to me, because I say this all the time, just that the Zodiac ever, killer never committed crimes like this. The Zodiac never targeted children. The Zodiac never uh, moved the bodies of the victims. The Zodiac never stripped the victims naked. He's saying that that is somewhat of an unacceptable response for everything, because... The Zodiac was an inconsistent serial killer, and more or less Jay is correct. So for this episode, I wanted to pay a little bit more attention to the murder of Brian McDonnell and look at how there actually could have been some type of Zodiac involvement playing, um, well, playing the cards in an honest way, giving it an honest attempt at evaluating a Zodiac killer connection. And, I mean, I do have to insist, no matter what the Zodiac killer was, mentally ill, deranged, out of touch with his complete set of mental faculties. And the evidence for this is that he is seeming somewhat composed and in control when he's writing the letters, and it's not just, like, absolutely all over the map, and he's not just scribbling and writing in crazy, crooked lines and such. 
he seems like someone who is actually trying to convey a particular message, cold, methodical, and calculating, but at the same time, he's murdering people, so instantly he's mentally ill and deranged, he's taking credit for it, he is some type of very, very pathetic jerk who simply got out of control and was able to hide in so in the corners and cracks of society and not get caught. Sickening when you think about it. But my ultimate conclusion is, I don't see enough evidence to suggest that the Zodiac Killer committed the murder of Brian V. McDonnell by explosive because there just doesn't appear to be enough of a confession Let's look at another example about how the Zodiac Killer would indirectly confess to something. The Kathleen Johns incident. The Zodiac Killer said that he abducted Kathleen Johns off of Highway Route 132 on March 22nd of 1970. Didn't take credit for it until months later, mind you. But then he said that he gave a woman and her baby a ride a few months back. I mean, that's indirectly taking credit for the abduction of Kathleen Johns. I also don't believe the Kathleen Johns incident was genuine Zodiac activity, but I just simply wanted to point out that this would be how the Zodiac was indirectly taking credit for a crime, no matter what you think about it. That's it. That's what he was doing. He was taking credit for the abduction of Kathleen Johns. With the murder of Brian McDonnell, there just seems to be a little bit more of an attempt to distance himself from this particular crime, and... I mean, I'm approaching things with an open mind. It could be he actually did it and is trying to confuse people. Why? Because he's crazy. But there's also a larger theory out there. And I don't know how you guys are going to respond to this. I'd give the person a shout out if I had the comment in front of me. I, I'd, I would address them by name. But they stated that the Zodiac Killer may have been a former police officer, either a fired police officer or someone who was no longer a police officer for some reason. That's why he had such high knowledge of police procedures, which I do think the Zodiac Killer had a reasonably high amount of knowledge concerning police procedures, but also that he committed he he would commit crimes against people in secluded areas, but maybe he wouldn't want to kill another police officer because he still thought there was some type of brotherhood involved. And even though his life fell apart, he didn't blame the other police officers. He blamed the rest of society. And that makes it a little bit uncertain. But I would love to know what you guys think about any of the crimes that have been discussed in this case. And I know I was talking about um, some that are a little bit unrelated, but they are going into the true crime talk uh, category, the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson, as well as the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey. And right now, I would like to get to your shout outs. There, anybody who makes a donation on buymeacoffee.com will get a shout out here on Zodiac Monday. And the first one comes to us from Ray Grant, author of Zodiac Killer Solved. Ray Grant saw that I made another episode about his book, and he gave the shout-out. Much appreciated. And, of course, Ray Grant is also the author of Zodiac Killer Dreams, which is a novel that was inspired by the Zodiac Killer mystery, and it gives a narrative story on some of the characters, as well as introducing a time travel element. And one more time, over the last week, I made short episodes on Zodiac Killer Solved by Ray Grant, How to Find Zodiac by Jared Kobeck, and the Zodiac Killer Cover-Up by Lyndon Lafferty. And the next one comes to us from Batman. Batman bought you a coffee. I never get tired of saying that. And Batman says, The name Dahan in the Indian origin means good, superior, fine, and excellent. Hey, Batman, thank you so much. I don't have an ounce of uh, Indian heritage, but I absolutely appreciate the optimistic words. And one more time, anybody who makes a donation via buymeacoffee.com will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. There's a link to that in the description box, but you can also get it at buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88. That's the same name as my Instagram handle. And anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnid88 one more time on Instagram. And I'll see you over there for the bonus podcast. Goodbye.